Hello, everybody. I'm queer for a good time, not for a long time. And this is Social Economics, a Marxist reading of Death Stranding. When searching for criticism in the video game Death Stranding, there's a lot that can be said about the story. There are podcasts, multi-hour video essays, just trying to unpack the surreal extra reality that this game's narrative lives in. The imagery, the voice acting, and the metaphors are big. Really big. But between those moments of absurdity are moments of calm, moments of reflection. Moments where the President Mom and Sister Named America subtext falls away and you are left with just the task at hand. You're left with the work, and so is Sam. Part 1. Sam Bridges, a working man. Sam Bridges is your playable character, acted out head to toe by motorcycle man Norman Reedus. Sam Porter Bridges is a courier in this post-ghost apocalyptic America where everyone left alive lives in underground shelters in isolation from each other. His work is that of a porter. It's his job. It's also his middle name. Literally. As the great video essayist Noah Caldwell Gervais points out, you are a porter. You build bridges. You do it all game long. Uh, quick shout out to Noah Caldwell, uh, he does some of the best video game criticism on YouTube, so check out his video on Death Stranding. The early game cutscenes are pure spectacle. From a baby in a jar you just strap to your chest and shake when it gets sad, to mom's cancer-ravaged body jumping out of her deathbed to give you your main quest with her last dying breath. Many players understandably found this very alienating, myself included. There's a lot happening in the early hours as far as plot goes, but nothing really meant anything to me. And like Sam, I only started finding, or perhaps it was constructing, meaning, once I got to work. I feel that some people who didn't like Death Stranding's gameplay felt it was too much work. Death Stranding doesn't make you feel like a badass, at least not until the very end, and the world around you is often more dangerous than Sam has the capability of being. There is so much to do, and Death Stranding aims to keep you busy. The core of the gameplay is about traveling by foot, vehicle, and zipline across the entire former United States connecting settlements to the ghost internet and bringing them into a new coalition of what remains of the US government. This overarching plot aside, the real meat of the game comes with all the deliveries and connections you're going to make along the way. That is your job, and name, after all. But what does work look like in a world after the Death Stranding event? Part 2. What is work? After the chain of supernatural explosions known as the Death Stranding, there is no money. No worldwide debt-based economy. Right now, in our capitalist society, money is generally how we are taught to value work, for most people in the form of wage labor. We qualify our work as worth so many dollars an hour. In capitalism, we have to participate in wage labor to create surplus value for those that own the means of production. These are the capitalists. The means of production are generally the raw materials, facilities, machinery, and tools used in the production of goods and services. This world is scattered with resources. They're everywhere but 100 units of metal in a suitcase on the side of the river is only worth as much as what it can be used for, what can be made out of them through human labor. Karl Marx called commodities that satisfy some human need or want, or which serve a useful purpose, as having something called use value. This follows that while you could make random deliveries of resources found around the world, those resources that have not yet been claimed as private property, more on this later, you provide the greatest utility to people by getting them what they need, what is of use to them. Part 3. Modes of Production. The Ways We Produce. Labor in Death Stranding, just like in real life, can be difficult. But, just like real life as well, humans throughout history, when given a task to perform, find strategies and use tools to improve the way that they work. Death Stranding gives you an ever-increasing armament of tools to help you make your treks, sometimes back and forth, much easier. These are advancements in production. Production here meaning delivering commodities with use value to people. An example early on is getting medicine to people so that they don't die. That medicine has use value to the people that are sick because they don't want to die. These advancements cause less effort to be spent on a task that yields the same amount of value. This creates a surplus of value when compared to our mode of production from before the advancement. In our capitalist system, the surplus would not go to the worker that created the efficiency, but to the capitalist that owns the means of production. Luckily for Sam, ghost explosions killed capitalism. Sam gets to keep the fruit of his labor and ingenuity. Did he install a zipline between two frequently 
frequently visited outposts? Great, that makes his delivery both faster and safer from environmental damage. Did he build a bridge over water too deep to wade through? He just saved himself a mile walk down the river to find a shallow section he could cross. The ghost internet that President Mom wanted us to spread throughout the country has a byproduct of sharing some of the work that you've done in-game to make efficiencies for other players to use. The surplus of value you experience when making a shortcut here isn't just staying with Sam, it's being spread among the other players' worlds. We are sharing the surplus in a post-stranding economy. This idea that non-competitive ideas, altruism, and solidarity in the face of a collective struggle is a good thing has either consciously or subconsciously rubbed the reactionary and the alt-right the wrong way. I mean, it tends to worry fascists when we work in solidarity with those in likened struggles. Like, say, for instance, um common class struggles, let's say. The game is political, but not in the way that you can make the Bridges hat Sam wears looks like a MAGA hat, but more in the way that Death Stranding reinforces through its gameplay and narrative that social connection, solidarity, and mutual support builds coalitions. Working with others makes surviving easier for everybody. We all gain when we all participate. Part 4. Antagonistic Factions Now the world of Death Stranding is not a communist utopia. There are those that do not want in, and then there are those that are stuck in the old ways of being. The first group are separatists, or outposts that are usually in hostile locations or at least have a hostile attitude to you. They generally don't want to join the federation of cities that the new US government is going for. Some don't even want you hooking them up to the ghost internet for their own benefit. You can still approach these people and win them over, not by force or persuasion or by being more right than them, but by offering assistance and providing value to them. Being a comrade. This often leads to building a relationship with these at first reactionary and defensive outposts. Now the second group I refer to, you do not get to offer help, and that is because they are directly and immediately hostile. These are the mules. While I've seen some really wonderful critiques of Death Stranding, a lot of people don't know what to make of the mules. Mules are, within the fiction, former porters that got addicted to delivering and now just want to take the cargo from other porters that are doing runs. This is where even the game seems to be confused about the motivation of the mules. In the game logs, it says they steal luggage from porters because they are addicted to the high of making deliveries. Another log in the game refers to people feeling depressed and useless once automated drones started making deliveries instead of porters. Quarters. Delivering made them feel valuable. They had been creating value by distributing things people needed to where they needed it. It wasn't just the act of moving a suitcase from one location to the other that the mules miss, it was creating value through their work in general. Perhaps this explains why the mules are hostile towards Sam. They see someone with work that matters, someone creating value and being valued by others in return, and it pisses them off. So they attack Sam and other porters too when they come within the bounds staked out in one of their camps, one of the few instances of sprawling private property that's not just a circle around an outpost. Their reaction is either to punish him for having Having what they are lacking, or to try to steal the valuable commodities he is carrying. Here's the tragic twist for the mules, though. Since the mules do not end up delivering the packages, they seem to misidentify where the value actually is. They see the package the porter is carrying as having inherent value that they crave, that they remember. So they grab it, and then they hoard it. They make it private property and fetishize the object like it retains its value once it's been alienated from its social relations, from its use value. Does it retain value for them? Just like capitalists can own a factory, the means of production, without human labor, the factory will produce nothing on its own. It doesn't matter how much money or capital you throw at a piece of wood, it won't make itself into a chair. The mule supply bins at the center of their camps are full of stuff, sure, but you could easily find that stuff scattered around the landscape. There is no artificial scarcity like there is in market economies, so just having stuff isn't necessarily useful. Sure, they have often collected resources that Sam would need to build structures and roads, but they are only valuable to Sam because they are the means of production which, through his labor, can create value in the form of bridges, roads, and other advancements within his goals as a porter. The mules misunderstand how raw resources are transformed through labor to create value that was not there in the material's original state. And just like capitalists, they rely on private property and force through organized violence to protect their stolen spoils. Part 5. What's in it for me? So you're doing all this work, you're helping all these people, but what is Sam getting out of the arrangement? 
As I previously mentioned, you won't be paid in money, but there is an economy within Death Stranding, and it consists of likes. Whenever interacting with a structure or a sign of another player, you have the opportunity to give it likes. This functions as a form of in-game social currency. This allows qualitative metrics of how useful a player's contribution is to the others. It is important that while you cannot run out of likes to give, you can only give so many to a single structure at a certain time. This makes it so you can give more likes to something that is extremely helpful, and perhaps only one or two to a sign you pass on the way up the mountain. Pity likes. This allows for likes to correlate to how valuable something is to the community, here for the porters, with minimal amount of inflation from single individuals. While likes can be used to approximate the average value of something, like we do with money under capitalism, it acts differently than money does in important ways. First of all, likes cannot be exchanged for goods or services. The only mechanical in-game bonus you get through amassing likes is improvements to your basic stats and what resources are available to synthesize at friendly outposts. I would argue that these stat boosts are narratively justified as just the natural progression of Sam getting stronger and better at his job, as well as the developing relations with others over time. They know him better, so they want to help him out. They upgrade the climbing claws or whatever the fuck. Even if you unlock a more advanced tool through receiving likes, you don't pay for it in likes. You don't exchange likes for that. Friendly outposts will make whatever they know how to make for you, as long as they have the means of production, the raw materials. There was almost always enough community resources in an outpost pool of materials to craft from that I could always make something for Sam. I was rarely ever in need of something if I had not overproduced based on the materials available. I noticed though, being able to rely on a community resource also emotionally incentivized me to bring home a few raw materials I found while I was out doing deliveries. Oh, 200 units of ceramics? I could sure drop that off at Central Knot City. It's easy to assume that likes function similarly to how they do in social media, but this is not the case. The name is about where it ends. As Peter Coffin points out pretty often, because social media exists within our capitalist landscape, it takes on the structure of market economies. Social capital, and the attention that comes with it in our capitalist world can be converted into hard capital, money, pretty easily through ads, social influence, etc. There is no such conversion to be had in the world of Death Stranding. You cannot make hard capital out of likes. You're still gaining social capital, but in a more organic way that represents both the amount and the quality of the connections you're making with others. Also, the utility that you provide to those communities that you are also a part of. This is why socialists point to capitalism as a force that corrupts our ideas of value, work, and power. It frames the way we look at our world and the people around us. Mark Fisher's book, Capitalist Realism, does a great job explaining how the drives and incentives of capital are moralized and essentialized as not only just the way things are, but the only way things could be. Death Stranding is an important game in that it gives us an example of modes of production, relations to other people, and distribution of resources that operates outside of the drives of capitalism. The physical world of Death Stranding can be unkind and vast, but the social future it presents in the face of such adversity gives me hopes that we might survive together. Thank you for watching.